maybe just talk about your first early training and let's just focus on the musical part first and then bring yeah, it in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, after school, I went to uh, London University to, to study music. I did a, a degree in music and I did a master's degree in music. Um, and I did a diploma at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. Um, I was a trumpet player and composer and um, I, I began kendo actually a year later than I've been saying recently. Recently I was thinking that I started in 1980 but I actually started in 1981 so all my claims to having been training for 40 years are fortunate <laughs> <laughs> and um, I take that back temporarily at least until April next year um, but I started training kendo um, when I was doing my postgraduate work at London University um, and I met a friend who had done karate in the past. He'd moved into the area um, and he was looking for a karate club and we looked around and we accidentally came across a kendo club run by a Japanese teacher and we went along to look um, and it was clearly authentic, you know, even with me having no knowledge, but he having his karate knowledge, it was clear to both of us that it was authentic and we joined. Um, he didn't stay very long. He found the karate club that he wanted to, but I stayed with it. Um, so about a year later in May 1982, um, just about the time I was uh, receiving my master's degree, I started doing Iaido and, and from that time I was training six or seven days a week, Iaido and Kendo, mm. uh, and just built it up from there. So um, my Iaido Shodan was in August 1982, so that's kind of the kickoff point. That was the first seminar that I went to. It was the first time I'd seen a high-grade teacher. That was Ishido Shizufumi-sensei, who was seventh dan Kyoshi at the time. Obviously, he's eighth dan Anshi now, but he was seventh dan Kyoshi then. Um, and it was my first experience of working in a big dojo, my first experience of working with a high grade, my first experience of a taikai, and my first experience of a grading, all in two days. It was, um, it was pretty hectic. So I just want to quickly go back to when you were first introduced to Kendo. One, what, why did your friend believe that you would be interested in something like this? If you were a music major, you typically don't see someone being also active and into something where you're like technically oh, no. in combat. It, it was the other way around. Um, we were having a conversation and he uh, was talking about how he had done karate. And I was saying, because I'm sitting at a desk all day, I need to do something physical to get fit. Let's uh, go and try and find something. So it was it was my initiative in, in the first instance. Okay. And so had you looked at other stuff and then how did you land on trying kendo? Well, no, we hadn't. We, we were um, quite simply looking at all of the adult education classes in the area. Um, and we found various karate classes that were run by third dan, second dan, fourth dan. And he was already third dan, so he was looking for a, a teacher of a higher level. Um, it didn't make any difference to me. I didn't understand what dan was and I'd never done any. Um, but as we were looking through the lists of classes, before we'd even visited anything, we saw Kendo with a, with a Japanese teacher, which was uh, um, uh, Fuji-sensei, who became my first Kendo, my first Iaido teacher. Mm. Okay. So the, the other question I had was, um, when you first start out Kendo, like you're not hitting anything, but eventually you're going to start uh, participating in Shia, you're going to put on Bogu. And mm. for... For people that, are, you, as their profession, they need to use your hands, in this case, as a musician, did mm. you worry about, like, parts of your body being smashed and, like, you losing... No, no, I, I didn't, because uh, Fuji Sensei taught in a very traditional way, um, uh, and it was not rough and, and aggressive. Well, I mean, aggressive, obviously, is the nature of, of the art, but it was not competition-orientated, it was not... Um, brutal it was it was um very elegant and very um skill oriented uh, and of course it was hard work um but i didn't i didn't see anything that would lead me to believe that injury was was um possible or probable 
no I, I didn't worry about that at all as a trumpet player of course I only need three fingers so as long as as long as my right hand is safe I'm fine <laughs> yeah. okay so th that gives us a glimpse of like your your beginning days how did you discover kendo and start it but let's just mm. stick with the I have a few topics that when you uh, brought up your, your traditional uh, music training that I yeah like to just discuss and then see how we can bring that into martial arts. Um, I have a list here. One of them would be um, as a performer versus as a composer. Uh, like what, what kind of training is that like? Another one is what is it like for having uh, like a musical performance of a single individual with one instrument compared to like an orchestra, uh, right. like a group of people doing it together. Uh, mm. There's the technical components versus the artistic components. Um, and then there's like traditional um, or the tradition of certain music teachings compared to like how modern fits in. So there's a lot of different ways that I think. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it, it, it's a huge subject and, and one could spend an hour just talking about the music, of course. Uh, I, I think what is particularly interesting is what aspects of musical training um, helped and supported my Iido development and Kendo development. Um, and uh, primarily, well, no, actually, there, there, are, there are two um, strings to this, really. One of them is the aspect of breathing. Um, many people doing Iaido find breathing very difficult. They can do all of the movements and you say, yeah, but don't forget to breathe. You've got to breathe through all of this and, and that <gasps> at the end of the kata, you know? Um, uh, whereas for me, uh, with my musical training, breathing is natural because breathing is the phrasing, breathing is the timing, breathe, everything is carried on the breath and everything moves naturally with the breath. Because of being a wind player, a, a trumpet player, um, uh, using the breath to um, determine the phrasing and the timing and the speed of things was almost intuitive to me. So when I started doing Iaido, I found it easier to do anything by breathing with it rather than holding my breath and, and worrying about breathing later. Um, and, and perhaps that's one reason why um, I've been quite successful in things like competitions and gradings. I, I mean, being British, my, my uh, instinct is to be very modest and not talk about stuff. But if we're going to talk about what actually happened, I'm going to have to kind of take a little bit of hubris here and, and speak about things that I did. Um, and, um, and, and so in this first seminar that I went to, for example, there was a taikai. Never seen a taikai before, didn't know what it was, but I, I won the taikai. So um, I, I found that breathing kept my stress under control because it's stressful, especially the first time you've ever done it. Um, Breathing kept my timing under control. I was watching other people whose timing was rushing away with them because they had no sense of, of, of the uh, context of the movements. Um, and, and so even from that early stage, I found that breathing was a fundamental part of not just the, the technique, but how you make everything knit together and everything fit together, how the form of the kata grows to a high point and then dies away towards the end. And that, that's all carried with the breathing. And, and that for me was, was quite natural, uh, as I say, as a trumpet player. So you mentioned a couple of things that helped in, especially that first taikai, which was the, the stress and the timing. Is that something mm. when, you're learn, when you're using that in your musical practice, was that also explicit? Because in like Iado, we, we talk about, okay, let's use your breath for this and this and this. In music, mm. is it just it just naturally came from the practice, or was there also it, it has to because it's a wind instrument, and and so the breath creates the notes, um, um, and so the the with the trumpet, how loud you play is determined by your breathing. How um, you phrase the music is determined by your breathing. The attack of the notes, the decay of the note is all determined by the breathing. So every detail relates back to breathing. Um, and so I found with uh, Iaido um, that 
increasing my breath pressure and increasing my breath speed up to the point of a cut and letting the breath die away and then letting it build up through kaburi and into the cut and then letting it die away again. I, I found this to be a very natural thing. I'm, I, I, I picked it up without being told and I was told later that's what we had to do and I was already doing it. So um, that, that came naturally. Um, and, and breathing as well, of course, is, is how one keeps stress under control. And as a music performer, you have stress. You walk out onto the stage, there's an orchestra there, you stand at the front. If you're a soloist, for example, you stand at the front and everybody's looking at you and they're expecting you to make a perfect performance. Now, um, how you breathe at that point will determine whether you keep everything under control. I think most of us um, who do Iido have done an embu at some stage, maybe in a taikai or in a grading, where we didn't have the breath under control right at the start and you never get it under control. And you can be seriously out of breath at the end of the embu. Um, and if that happens when you're playing a wind instrument, you haven't got a chance because you need the breath to produce the notes. Whereas it's not quite so fundamental to the, the actual technique and the movement uh, within Iaido, it, 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 is, it is when you're playing a wind instrument. But also um, the, the breathing can help with posture. Um, and if, you're, if your um, chest is collapsed and your breathing is high up in your chest, then you don't look confident. Um, and, and this is important for an Iaido embu. It's, if you're doing a grading, for example, you want to walk out there looking like you own the place and you want to walk out looking uh, at the grading panel and saying, I've earned this, I am a uh, fourth dan, for example, um, and I've come here to collect my menjo, not I'm a third dan, please will you give me fourth dan, just as a musician has to go out there saying, I know how to play this concerto, and I'm going to do it for you, I'm going to give it to you, I'm going to make you a gift of this music, and if you do that, they will forgive mistakes. But if you go out there looking timid and sheepish, they won't forgive the mistakes. The mistakes will become the things they remember. Uh, and so this breathing related to confidence, confidence related to projection, projection related to delivery, uh, it, it's very similar to both of these things. Could you talk about your process and getting your breath under control? You mentioned that when you walk out there, if you don't have it, then you have to somehow Get, bring it back in. So like, what, what is your process in doing that? Um, if I find I've lost it, um, the, the, the process is to make sure I'm breathing from extremely low down in the abdomen so that I'm using the diaphragm and pulling the air in by pulling the diaphragm down. Uh, sorry, but pushing the diaphragm. Yeah, but by moving the diaphragm one way or the other in and out and so on, rather than uh, in the chest. And I have to make sure that the shoulders are relaxed, but the chest is open, the chin is um, horizontal, level. So you're not sticking your chin out, but not tucking it down so that the, the breath can flow freely and that everything moves in the lower abdomen. Um, and taking one or two slow breaths uh, usually is enough to bring it back together, but that's from practice, of course. Um, uh, I, I think that somebody who hasn't got their breath under control simply because they've never had to work at getting their breath under control, it might take more than two. Mm -hmm. So the, the, I thought that was really fascinating when you're talking about how as a, uh, a wind instrument player, you had to use the breath to control everything. So if you had an instructor that was going to tell you, okay, your timing is off or you have to be louder here, softer here, they, they will talk about an outcome that they want to see and you yep. would you have no choice but to use your breath to create uh, that outcome. Um, and then, but when we're practicing Yaido or if you're doing like a, a string instrument, if someone talks about timing or loudness, softness, you can move your physical body, which is yeah. disconnected from your breath. So mm -hmm. how, how might you reconcile that? Or if for someone that has the, ex has the experience of playing a wind instrument, it seems like it's natural to yeah. the breath with the move, with the, outcome. How would you bring that to someone that doesn't have that experience? Oh, I, I think you just have to work at developing it. It's, it's as simple as that. Um, 
And musicians who are not wind instrument musicians will still use their breath to help with, with timing and, and, and phrasing uh, and body movement. So, you know, if you're watching somebody playing a violin concerto, for example, you will see that they move their body quite a lot. And a pianist will move their body quite a lot because they feel the rhythm in their body, uh, not necessarily directly through the, through the breath, but the breath will be part of that. Um, and with uh, Iaido, if you're performing a kata, uh, it's just something that you have to develop. Um, with a wind instrument, it's obvious that you're getting it or not getting it because you get the feedback of the sound coming out. Whereas if you're doing an Iaido kata, you don't get that kind of feedback. Now, somebody of high experience can look at a person who's doing a kata and say, you're not breathing. They can see it, they can feel it, they understand it, uh, even though the, the sequence of moves may still have come out. Um, uh, but it is still something that you need to develop. I, I was just lucky that I had already developed that in a previous study and was able to bring it with me to the art, but certainly wouldn't have got to where I am now if I hadn't learned to do those things. Do, do you remember seeing if you were if I don't know if you ever played in an orchestra with like stringed instrument players, but mm. do, you, do you can you make the same um, view of someone that's playing and you say, OK, you're playing a violin, but you're not breathing properly. What does that look like and how do you correct it? I, I'm not sufficiently knowledgeable about violin technique to know how much that would apply. It, it, it would be very difficult to say. I mean, you, you can hear the rhythm, you can hear the timing, you can hear their phrasing, um, but very often you see that as a movement in the body more than recognize it as a, uh, as a function of breathing. It may or it may not be the case. I'm, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't comment on that. Okay. So if, if anything more you wanna say about breathing? I, I have another topic I want to can move on to. Um, yeah, the, I, th I think one of the things people don't appreciate when they do Iaido is how much um, breath control you have to have in the sense of the, the, the length of the breath, because ideally a kata should be performed in one breath, and a kata is about 35 to 40 seconds. That means that you have to learn to control your breath so that the out breath is about 40 seconds long because some kata are 40 seconds so you need to be able to cover that and it's not necessarily the kata that you might think it is you know you look at um solgiri and you think oh that must be a long kata because there's six cuts <laughs> five cuts whatever um uh but in fact maya takes longer than solgiri because the timing of the build up into the new kitsuke and the time that is taken with Ochiburi and changing the feet actually adds so much time that it's, it's probably one of the longest kata. It takes about 45 seconds. Um, and so if you can do Maya in one breath, you're in with a good chance of being able to do all of the other kata in one breath. Um, um, yeah, so how do we... So, so, so as, a, as a trumpet player, that was, that was a, an important issue because you know, the length of the phrasing and when you choose to take a breath, um, there are only certain places where you can take a breath and you look at a piece of music and you think, oh my God, I've got to get from here to here without taking a breath. And the trap that we fall into is to take a deep breath. And that's the worst thing that you can do. Uh, and the same if you're, you're doing a long kata, if you take a deep breath, it's the worst thing you can do because what happens is you stretch your lungs and you put your lungs under tension and then the oxygen carbon dioxide balance all changes and you find that you can't hold your breath so long if you take too big a breath so you have to take uh, a slow natural breath and then just let it out uh, constantly and consistently through the kata um yeah that really that that's that's all i can say in a conversation if i was working with a student it might be different but uh, in a conversation that's about it well that's so interesting that you can look at a piece of music and just say, okay, at these points, I need to be breathing out or at this rate or at this like amount of pressure. Can you, when you look at a kata, do you have the same type of thing? Like for Nikitsuke, because it's this length, you need to breathe out at 
with this strength for this length of time compared to when you're doing food yeah again? oh yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and and it's different with different kata as well i mean if you're doing something like ukigumo or you're doing something like takiyotoshi or or sogiri or nukiuchi they're, they're all completely different timings and you have to have a, a breathing rhythm that suits the timing of that kata so could you walk us through maybe just one kata right now maybe choose one that's has a more abnormal type of rhythm to it i don't know if, maybe something from seite that everyone knows um yeah if you take uh kesagiri for example um you have three steps towards the opponent which are a small medium long step accelerating and your breath has to maintain a constant pressure because your hara has to be centered and strong and pushing directly towards the center of the enemy and so your breath has to focus your body movement towards the enemy uh, and there's this um, dichotomy between the acceleration of the feet and the acceleration of the body but the consistency of the breath your breath can't build at this point otherwise you'll have nothing left for the cut but then when you make the two cuts the breath can increase to make the the two cuts the upward cut and the downward cut but then um it's easy to fall into the trap of letting your breath stop at the end of the downward cut but in fact it has to tail off so and then as it tails off then you can begin your move back to hasokamai and keep this constant um uh fine uh exhalation during the hassle kamai so that you're you're settled and and um uh, confident and the uh when you make ochiburi maybe just a little bit more pressure to emphasize the the tenuchi and the timing and the sharpness of the end of the chiburi action um and uh, that's usually where most people run out of breath um but you will find that if you stop your breathing actually stop breathing um at that point for a, a couple of seconds you'll find that there is a little bit more that you can exhale if you try to keep exhaling you will run out but you can stop and your your body your lungs i don't know what the physiology is it seems to rebalance your need for oxygen or the, the amount of carbon dioxide, it, it's probably something chemical inside the lungs, which I, I, I don't understand. But you find that if you think you've completely breath, breathed, breathed out, and then you stop and hold in the out breath position, you find that there is a little bit more that you can push out. If your abdomen is tight enough and your diaphragm is working hard enough, there's a little bit more that you can push out. And that's the little bit that you push out when you make noto. So um, I remember one teacher, I can't remember who it was. I don't want to falsely ascribe it to anybody, but I think it was Haruna Sensei who said that the breath when you make noto is like a sigh of regret. Mm. It's just that last little bit of breath. Like I didn't, the feeling is I didn't want to have to do that. Uh, and that's the end of the breath. So then as you bring your feet together, you can take a soft breath in, don't show it in your shoulders, take a soft breath in and walk back away from, from the enemy to your, your start position. Wow, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so all kata follow this basic format, but you have to time it according to what's happening within the kata. So if you've got something like uh, Sampogiri, you've got three cuts in quite quick succession. Tang, sa, ha. You know, you've got one, two, three. Whereas in Shihogiri, the timing is completely different because of the turns, the rotations, the directions you have to travel, the way you move your feet to get from one enemy to another takes a different amount of time. So the, the rhythm of the pulse of the breathing is different. This is, this is my way of doing it. I know there are other ways of doing it. Marita Sensei teaches that it should be one constant uh, unending flow of breath all the way through. And he gets people in the dojo just to vocalize that. So uh, constantly, whether you're making Nukitsuke, Kiriroshi, Chiburi, it's a different way of doing it. I mean, it's not a, a an issue of right or wrong. It's just that that's his way of 
of showing that the breath has to be out all of the time. Harana Sensei used to vocalize the two main cuts with the key eye, tongue, and that's at the end of it is the is the um, conjunction that 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 um, uh, allows the feeling of continuity from the end of Kiryoroshi into the Chiburi or the Zanshin Kamai, whichever it is that follows. When you think about how much air is coming out, like it sounds like there's the speed of the air coming out, but then there's also the quantity, which kind of creates equation for pressure. So when, mm. when, when you think about it, do you, is it always the same amount of air, but the different speeds at which you're blowing out creates the pressure or do you somehow tighten your air waves, creating less volume for the air to come out and that's what creates the pressure? How do you think about that? That's an interesting question. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, the, the question sounds complicated and in fact the answer is probably more complicated even than the question. <laughs> um, you know, if, if, I, if I take that back to trumpet playing, for example, if you have a loud passage and you have a quiet passage, you would imagine that the loud passage requires more air and therefore the loud passage, you would need more breaths. In extremis, that's the case. I mean, if you're playing extremely loud or extremely quietly, then yeah, it is different. But if with, within the a kind of normal middle range, it doesn't change that much. Um, so I would have to say that the quantity probably doesn't change very much. Um, but the pressure changes, uh, and that pressure changes as a result of the um, tightening of the abdominal muscles, the what we generally call the harap, which um, from the breathing point of view, of course, includes the diaphragm, but the, the diaphragm area doesn't have to be hard and strong in the same way that the lower abdomen from the waistline down needs to be solid and stable. Um, so, yeah, the, this dividing line at the waistline where the breathing happens in the muscles above, but the solidity of posture and the solidity of um, uh, move, the, the stability of movement, which comes from the, the strength of the muscles below the waistline, they have to work independently. And I, I think that's one of the areas that people find very difficult. You know, they can tense everything or tense nothing. But to, to tense what's below the waistline, not tense what's above the waistline, so you can still breathe freely without losing the stability of your posture, uh, I think that, that's quite difficult. I, that's a bit of a distraction, but um, interesting nonetheless, I think. Yeah, this separation of where you tighten, like the lower abdomen to, to like most of the time when someone first tries to do it, they'll tighten the lower the abdomen and then the shoulders also tighten because it can't control. Is that a... Is that a result of um, just lack of awareness of your body and being able to control it? Or is it like we just don't have enough strength in our abdomen? Like we don't have any muscles there or we don't have access to those muscles. Because we, we talk about in, in sports a lot, there's a lot of exercises to strengthen the core. So is mm. that something that is more needed that we just need to strengthen that? Or can we be able to get this level by just going through the practice and thinking about it? I, I think most of us are quite unaware of, uh, unaware of our body is probably a little bit unfair, but certainly unaware of how independently we can move things which we didn't think we could move independently. So um, if I make a, an analogy with, with another action within Iido where it's easier to see, um, for example, if you make ochiburi and, and you close your fingers and squeeze the sword with your fingers, can you do that without stiffening your elbow or stiffening your shoulder? Can you make a strong, sharp chiburi, but only use your fingers and not use your arm muscles and not use your shoulder muscles? It's very difficult to do. But with practice, we can isolate them. But it is with practice. Um, and, and I think that with practice, providing there is a mindfulness and an awareness and a, a, uh, a deliberate intent to do so, you can separate these things. Um, it, 
you know, it's like when somebody starts playing the piano, they do a five finger exercise where it starts with the thumb and goes to the little finger and back. And then on the other hand, they go in the opposite direction because it uses the same fingers. Oh, wow, so they, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you start with your thumb and go in the opposite direction to your little finger and back and and you try and get those in time with each other. And that's not too difficult to do. And then you tell this beginner, OK, now you've got to go in the same direction. So while one hand starts with the thumb, the other hand starts with the little finger and you've got to go the opposite way in your hand so that the notes move in the same direction. And suddenly there's a whole new level of coordination that has to be developed. That makes um, me anxious just thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, it's very much the same with the Ido, you know. Um, it, it applies to almost every move. <laughs> yeah, you're starting to learn the piano now. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's more difficult than you think at first. Um, uh, and th this, this kind of thing, this kind of detail crops up everywhere. You know, we can learn to make a cut with our right hand. And if you're cutting single handed, you only use the right hand. There is no question that your right hand is controlling the sword. But when you cut with two hands, the left hand has to do the work. Can you be sure that the right hand isn't doing the work? Can you be sure that your cut is only powered by the left hand and the right hand is just going along for the ride? The right hand's job is to, to change the angle of the sword so that, the, so that you make diagonal cuts. But if you're making a vertical cut, it's the left hand does the work. If you're making a diagonal cut, it's the left hand that gives the power. The right hand just changes the angle of the sword. Um, and this is another coordination that people find extremely difficult. I have to admit, I find it very difficult for a long time. It, it took me many, many years. I'm, I think I'm beginning to get it now, but um, to only use the left hand, I mean, literally only use the left hand is extremely difficult to do. You can practice with just the left hand and say, yeah, I can do it with just the left hand. And as soon as you put the right hand on, both of them start working together again. Um, and, and the right hand will then cause the, the, the cut to not be straight or it will cause, uh, it cause the right shoulder to pull forward at the end of the cut, these kind of things. Um, Is that a sense the, of because we're mostly right-handed people? I don't think so, no, because left-handed people have the same problem. But with using their left hand? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's just when we're using two hands, we want to use both hands. Mm. Uh, I don't think it's anything to do with left or right handedness. Um, but, but these kind of coordinations, they, they uh, are difficult. You know? And uh, th then the, th there are the more um, separated coordinations of your hands moving with your feet, getting your hands to move at the right time, getting your feet to move at the right time. We talk about Kiken Tai Noichi and trying to get the body and the sword let's forget about the spirit for a minute, but the body and the sword to move at the same time so that we step forward and the, the, the body delivers the sword. And so that the power doesn't have to be great in the shoulders because the whole body weight is going behind it. But how do you get those two things to work at the same time? You can coordinate them in time you know, you can stamp a, like when, when beginners do kendo, stamp a foot and make the shinai hit at the same time and then shout at the same time. This is like opening a door to understanding what kiken taiichi is. It isn't yet kiken taiichi. There's no harmony in the body. There's just a, um, a coordination of timing. Um, but the, uh, the kiai, I think, is, is fundamental to that because, um, Everything that you do, every movement that you make relates back to your breathing. If you have your hands over your head and you try and move a hand and try and move a foot at the same time and move the foot so that it moves your body with a stable posture and move your hand without losing your posture and your shoulders, it's extremely difficult to do because you've got one thing right up high overhead and another thing down there on the floor and you're trying to make them work at the same time and get them to coordinate with a, a body movement. But if you've got a good, strong breath, you then don't have to coordinate your hand with your foot. You make your hand move with your breathing, you make your foot move with your breathing, and then the hand and foot 
work together. Um, and so if everything relates back to breathing, then how you breathe will determine how everything flows together, how everything coordinates, how everything works together. Um, and so when I'm working with some of my higher grade students and, and they're, they're making new kids get and their right hand is too stiff and they're holding the sword too tight, I, I tell them to think as though your right hand and the sword is floating on your breath. So as you breathe out, it's floating with your breath and it comes out and then you just close your fingers. There's no power, you just close your fingers. Uh, if you close your fingers with, say, a Vicky at the same time as you breathe and tighten the Hara, everything will be solid. You don't have to think about making, say, a Vicky at the same time as moving your hand, at the same time as you move your feet. All you have to think about is tightening the Hara and doing everything at the same time as the breath. So um, you mentioned the transition from um, coordinating everything to the same timing to actual harmony within the body is... Is that what you're saying? Like the breathing will make that link? Eventually, yes. Eventually. What, what will happen is um, uh, there will come a time when you notice that you're doing it. You know, it's, um, I, I use the analogy of learning to ride a bike sometimes when we're, we're talking about Iaido. When you can't ride a bike, it seems impossible. And when you can do it, you can't understand why you couldn't do it. But there is that transition moment where suddenly it comes to life and you're doing it and you didn't you didn't actually change anything not consciously you're just doing the same thing over and over and over again and then one time suddenly you're balancing your your body has learned how to balance this thing so that you can ride it uh, and it just happens because of practice and, you know, you can't, you know, maybe physiologically and, and neurologically, you can break that down further. But in a practical sense, if you, you know, you're working with a, a child learning to ride a bike, they just do the same thing every time and suddenly it happens. And I think this happens with uh, Eido practice as well. You just do it and do it and do it and do it and do it. And then suddenly one day you, out comes a new kit scare from nowhere and it feels like magic. And you think, wow, you know, the sword really whistled, my posture was strong, and I feel, I feel like I didn't do anything. Sometimes you can make a kiriroshi like that. You know, you're, you're working at it and your hands don't work together and your shoulders are stiff and you're fighting to get your shoulders soft and you're trying to breathe with the cut and the sound isn't there. You know, sometimes you've got no um, tachikaze, there's no, there's no sound coming from the blade at all. And then one day you just do one and it's, it's like magic. And you think, I didn't do anything, but it worked. And then of course you spend the next six weeks trying to do it for a second time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, that, that's the process, the, the process of um, finding how to make these things happen naturally um, is, is a, it's a very simple process, but we try to make it complicated. And I think we can simplify it if the breathing is core to the movements rather than the movements become the, uh, the be all and end all of what you're trying to do. And I'll oh, worry about breathing later. I, I think that's the wrong way around. I think the breathing has to be the core of the movement. I, I teach breathing with my beginners now, right from the start. You know, come up onto your knees and breathe out. Forget about the sword. Come up onto your knees and breathe out. Come up onto your knees and step forward with your right foot and keep the breath coming out. Keep breathing out as you move. Yeah. Okay, now we'll think about the sword. Don't forget your breathing, you know, and, and just keep the breathing to be core to all of the movements. And, and I'm finding students are making progress much more quickly than they have in the past. Maybe not a big enough sample size to be definitive, um, you because know, obviously Iido is not a, a majority um, uh, interest to have very few people but generally speaking I'm finding people are, are learning quicker by uh, working the breath first and then adding the movements to it. Mm -hmm. So up until this point we've been talking about the the solo arts like Iido and Kendo. Well Kendo is not solo but you have to do it your own way and also mm -hmm. playing an instrument by yourself. How do you think about using your breath to 
now be in harmony with others. So whether you're playing an instrument in an orchestra or you're doing something like Jodo where there's like a balance and then even more so in Kido, we have to use breath to match our tachi, our group of five and move at the same time, do things in harmony. How do you think about using breath to as a group? Mm. That, that's a difficult question, really. Um, I, playing a musical instrument in an orchestra, yes, you, you will use your breath to feel the phrasing in preparation to an entry. So if you're, you're silent and you're waiting to come in, you have to use your breath to feel your place with everybody else so that you come in naturally and in time with everybody else. So there's a harmony there that comes from um, you know, moving, uh, moving your breath at the side of them, and then then just entering with them. Um, and um, my my experience of of kendo and and jodo is not sufficiently great to be authoritative on this, but I have found with kendo that if I can feel the other person's breath timing, and I can breathe with them it was easier to find a way to move ahead of them. Hmm. Um, and certainly I find the same with Jodo, that if I feel the other person's breathing, the Kendo Kata are exactly the same. If I feel the other person's breathing, I can feel when they're going to move. And if I feel when they're going to move, I know instinctively when to move because my breath just moves with theirs. Um, Kiai, of course, makes it easier to, to pick up that timing, but you're not key eyeing all the time, you know, walking in with no key eye, but then there's a, a key eye on the attack. You should already have the breath by then. And you can't wait until the attacker makes a key eye to try and get the breathing. You have to have found it already. Um, but um, with a lot of practice, I've found that I can feel the other person's breathing and then move in time with their breathing. Whether that harkens back to um, musical experience and working with orchestras, I wouldn't like to say. It's the the time difference is is huge, and uh, it may still be latent inside me that and it, it's working, or it may just be that I've picked this up separately. Mm -hmm. So the another topic I was wanted to bring up was how the quality of the tools impacts your performance. So instruments, we can say you have the cheap ones and then you have the super expensive ones. Same thing with sword, there's uh, quality, high quality, low quality. How do you see the these things relating to each other from music and martial arts? Uh, with music, it's, it's fairly essential because the... Um, uh, say trumpet because that's my experience. Um, with a cheap instrument, the tone quality varies across the range. So it might be harsh in one area, it might be soft in another area and so on. And you can't have that um, uh, variation. Uh, and also um, the, the quality of the engineering in cheap instruments tends to make certain notes quite badly out of tune. And it's very difficult for the player to to push that back into tune with their technique. It's possible, but they don't want to be working at that all of the time. They they want to know that if they blow into the instrument, the note's going to come out fairly much in tune um, most of the time. So so with performance, you do need an instrument of a quality that matches your ability and experience. Um, but with Iaido, I used to, I used to be very sensitive to the quality of the sword. But now I'll pick up any stick and do a kata with it. It, it doesn't bother me anymore. I, you know, um, I go to a seminar and um, maybe I've flown to another country, didn't take a sword with me. They give me the Iaido and it, it's like a piece of railway line, but it's okay. I'll just get on and do the kata with it. Um, or... Uh, pick up a bokken and the bokken feels like it's got a lead weight in the kisaki, but I can still still do the kata with it. I'm not so concerned. Of course, for one's everyday practice and, and for performing an embu to the highest quality that one is capable of doing, um, 
it it's good to have the blade that you're used to practicing with your your normal everyday sword but even that isn't possible you know when uh, I've been to Japan to do uh, a grading and I've been to Japan to do Embu at the Kyoto Taikai and you have to you have to use a Shinken but you can't take a Shinken to Japan because of the sword licensing laws in Japan so arriving in Japan you have to start using a sword that you've not used before and maybe only have four or five days to get used to it which really is not very long um, and other people's taste in swords doesn't necessarily match your own so somebody will be um, uh, really excited about the fact that I've got a really really lovely sword you can use please use my sword and thank you very much thank you very much you take it out you think oh my god I'm going to have to use this for five days um, it isn't necessarily that it's bad quality it's just that we're used to different things um, and so from that point of view it's necessary to be able to get used to a sword very quickly and and not to be too uh too too critical of of the the weapon just get on with it and do it hmm. when it, so one thing i think about where i hear because i i don't have a custom sword but there are like the macro uh construction features and then there's the micro ones the macro ones are like the length the overall weight uh and the balance and then yeah. micro ones are like how long the tsuka is to, compared to your hands is it shaped to mm -hmm. your hands so that your you, people with longer fingers or shorter fingers can hold how do you think about these qualities sure. and as you're growing up in level which ones become more important um i i think for everybody the length is important because there, there is the, this standard principle that when your right arm is fully extended and your left hand is right back at your hip as far as it will go with no distortion in your body posture, you should have just the boshi left inside the seiya. Um, and there is only one length that will do that. Uh, it should be possible to use a shorter or a longer sword with a little bit of um, ad adjustment. Um, but uh, for your own sword for everyday use we all know what length sword we use and we would never buy a sword that is different to the length that we use um depth of the curve i don't think it makes a huge amount of difference other people may disagree and uh, and i'm i'm quite open to the fact that that really is a matter of opinion um balance well yeah, you pick up a sword and you know instantly that I'm going to get on with this sword or I'm not going to get on with this sword. You don't have to be, um, you don't have to specify it. You you can't specify it really. You just pick it up and you know, yep, I can deal with this sword or I, I can't deal with that sword. Um, for the sword that you use every day, especially if you're using, if you're doing a lot of training, then the size and shape of the skirt is very important. It's very important. The, the length of the scar should be so that when your little finger is holding um, the last um, wrapping of the, uh, of the makiito and your forefinger of your right hand is just back from the um, fujiyane, the space between your hands should be two finger widths. So there is a very specific length for everybody's hands. And if you don't have that length, you'll either find that your hands are very closely jammed together, which makes it very difficult to, to manipulate the sword. Um, if your hands are jammed together, it's difficult to, to uh, get details right, like in, for example, Solgiri, where your hands and the kisaki have to be on the centre line at the end of each of the first three cuts. It's very difficult to do that if your hands are jammed tight together. But if your hands are a long way apart, it's very difficult to get a sharp, decisive movement in the kasaki at the end of the cut. So this length is prescribed for a very specific reason. And um, I think you have to, you really have to ensure that your scat is the right length. Um, as far as the thickness of, is concerned and the, the profile of the scat, yeah, I, I now realise that it is more important than I thought it was in early days. Again, when I go to another country and somebody lends me a sword and I, I, it's got a scat that feels like a, a, a pencil, 
um, and and your your fingers are you you barely feel the scar because your fingers are too long. You you begin to realise that the thickness of the scar is quite important because your your fingertips have to fit into the white diamonds of the the wrapping of the maquito. The fingertips have to fit there, uh, and if your fingertips don't fit into the maquito properly, then your tenuchi is is not going to work properly. You're going to be holding the sword too tight. Mm -hmm. So uh, as a general rule of thumb, this, this doesn't have to be prescriptive, but um, at what kind of level of experience do you think you should be paying more attention when you're getting a sword? Typically one starts out with like a very cheap Yaito when they start, and then at like what rank or so level should they be looking at getting a new sword with more refined? Uh, I think attention? at the point where they realize that what they've got isn't working for them. I, I think it's really as simple as that. I, I don't think you can say at this grade you need that and at this grade you need that. I, I think you work with what you've got and there will come a time where you think actually this sword's a bit too heavy or the scar is a bit too thin and maybe you just need to have a new scar made. You don't need a new sword perhaps or you get the new scar made but when you put it onto the sword the balance changes in such a way that you can't control it and that's unfortunate but this kind of thing can happen. Um, yeah, I, I think you just have to go with your instinct and your budget. Obviously, the budget is going to have a, a, a deciding factor for a lot of people. So an, another thing, you, you mentioned that sometimes when you travel, you have to get use someone else's um, equipment. If you're going to Japan, most likely it's like a senior sensei with that you're highly respecting. You don't want to do anything. And similarly, in music, uh, sometimes you're playing something and then you're used to using like a $2,000 instrument and sometimes someone gives you a $10,000. How does that play mm -hmm. into your performance when you're, when you're thinking about it, when you're using something that's like not yours, doesn't belong to you, you know it's super expensive, that's a yeah. different type of pressure. Yeah, we, 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 with wind instruments you generally don't do that. It generally doesn't happen because of hygiene and so on. Um, I, th I think violinists would be more likely to, and, and pianists would be more likely to come across that kind of problem. And I don't have the experience of that. Um, and as a trumpet player, the thing that would make more difference to me than anything else would be the mouthpiece. Mm. Just the piece that your mouth goes against, because that's the point of interaction. That's the point where you produce the source buzz that becomes the sound that comes out the other end of the instrument. And changing the mouthpiece can have a drastic effect. On, on what you can and can't play or the sound that comes out, the quality of the sound that comes out. Um, I, I think it's less, less appropriate to musicians than it is to, to a Budo when we're traveling around. You know, if I, I don't play very much now, but if I were to go to another country, I would take my instrument with me if I were playing, but if I were, if I'm training, I don't take a sword with me. I, I borrow one when I get there. Mm -hmm. I'm probably better at Eido than I was at trumpet playing, to be honest. <laughs> do, do you have an experience you can talk about where you went to Japan and you had to use someone's sword for an embu or something? And um, yeah, when in 2000 I went to Japan. Um, for the first time, and that was my first attempt at seventh down grading. Um, and Harris Sensei had borrowed two swords from two of his students, and I could choose which of those two swords I wanted to use. And one of them had a balance very similar to my own, very similar, um, but the shape was different, the curve was quite different. Um, and the other one, the curve was very similar, but the, the weight and the balance was totally different. Um, and so I chose the one with the similar balance, the similar weight. Um, but the amount of training that I was doing in preparation for seventh down grading was just unreal. I mean, it was like 10 hours a day for a week, really hard work training. And having a sword that isn't the one you're used to, even if it's only slightly different, you start to get aches in places, you know, you didn't know you had places and muscles are aching that you didn't know existed. It's, it's really, really hard work. Um, 
so if it were just a case of picking it up to do an embu, like if I'm teaching in a seminar, I go to Switzerland and somebody will lend me Niaito, I'm not doing many kata. I'm just doing a little bit of a kata here and a little bit of a kata there, maybe demonstrating a kata slowly. It doesn't have that stress on the body. But uh, if you're going somewhere and doing a huge amount of training in preparation for a, a grading, for example, it has an enormous stress on the body, really, really enormous stress on the body. Um, and uh, it certainly focuses your mind on the day of the grading. Sorry, I just need, there's a spider on the table. I just want to get rid of it. <laughs> okay, um, do you have a little bit more time? Because I still have a few questions related yeah, to it. Yeah, sure, sure. And, sure. and, and I, and I also made notes here to talk about the type of training that I did immediately after passing sixth and seventh done, or maybe yeah. we can leave it for another time. I think we'll that, that will cover another another whole interview. So yeah. because I think just this music stuff, there's so much No, I don't want to be hogging these by doing three or four when everybody else has only done one. <laughs> well, yours yours was number four. We're almost at fifty. So if we wait till like after fifty-four, it would have been fifty episodes yeah. between the first one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, but this is useful, and I yeah, like sure. that. I want to develop this area too. Um, so another question related to these is how do how do you think space affects a performance? So obviously, in in music, we can be clear. There's like the resonance will change the the way you feel it, um, mm -hmm. but also like if you were to demonstrate. Yaido in a gymnasium compared to at the Kyoto Taikai in the Budokan, there's also mm. there. how do you think about these uh, differences in the space and how that impacts the performance and then how do you do you change the way that you do your performance or you feel the performance in those cases? Um, I, I interesting question. I hadn't really thought that, that thing through yet. Um, The mental preparation is different when the, the hall is different. If you're in a gymnasium or if you're in a, 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 a so-called sacred place like the Butokuden. Um, yeah, and, and of course the quality of the floor is, is different. The, the floor of the Butokuden is, is magical. It's like the perfect floor you cannot imagine if you've not used it. Um, but in a gymnasium, of course, it can be one of these horrible plastic non-slip non surfaces, which is the worst thing that you can possibly have for, for doing Iido. Um, but beyond that, beyond the actual um, initial sense of where you are and why you're there and the psychological effect that that can have, all of that is brought under control, I think, for me, uh, when I'm walking out onto the space, because I tend to visualize the enemy of my first kata being already there. Um, it kind of doesn't make practical sense. I mean, if your first kata is Maya and there's somebody sitting there on the floor who's going to be your enemy and you go and sit in front of them, you're not then going to take the sword out and put it on the floor and do tore. It doesn't make practical sense in that sense. But it helps me to focus my, my metzka and my thought. It brings my thoughts in to the um, shiaijo or the embujo uh rather than the dojo um so i i bring it down into the area that i'm working in as, as a, a a small section of the the main hall that encompasses everything i try not to take in all of those other things it can be quite daunting you know first time that you do an embu at the uh, kyoto taikai it's quite daunting because of the circumstances um, and although you're facing, you start off, you walk on facing towards the, the, the shrine, the seats are full of eighth dans watching the embu, you know, eighth dans and hanshi and, and guests and, and highly respected people. And you walk on seeing all of these people, it can be quite daunting. And, and you have to shut that all out. And I shut that out by having an image of, of the enemy for the first kata and to try to bring my mind into my embu jo 
as, as opposed to to the dojo as a whole. Mm -hmm. So in, in that sense, it doesn't matter if you're in a, like a, a sacred place or in just a regular gymnasium, you want to walk in with that mindset. Yeah, that I want to, yes. Uh, whether I do or not, whether I'm successful will depend on the, the day, you know, but generally speaking, I am I have so far been able to manage to do that. The, the first time I, I attempted seventh stand in 2000, I didn't have the experience for that. And I was awed by the circumstances and confused by um, the way the grading was organized was different to the way, just the details. I mean, the the... the um, the macro event was the same, but the, the micro details were different. Uh, and that kind of threw my focus and concentration. Um, I'm not saying that that is why I failed and maybe just failed because I wasn't good enough. But the, the, the fact is, it, it meant that I went out there with the, the wrong mindset. But I think I've fixed that since then. What do you notice about the sound? also in a space like sometimes you're in a big gym the fans are going you can't hear anything sometimes it's more quiet and you can hear like the breathing of the audience and the friends and then mm -hmm. if you go to it and then some places you can't hear the the cutting sound some places you mm -hmm. can't how does that kind of change how you feel about uh, the space not so much now as it used to certainly but it used to if i couldn't hear my sword i would just think i wasn't cutting very well and, and then of course you put more power in and you try and cut faster and try and get a sound that you can hear. And of course that's completely the wrong thing to do. Um, and I've learned not to do that now. I've learned that the feeling in my hands is what tells me whether I'm cutting correctly or not. Um, a lot of noise can be distracting, but again, if you keep a good mental focus and your, um, your focus on Kasoteki is, is strong enough, you can cut all of that out. You can cut all the superfluous stuff out if your um, your belief in your kasateki is strong enough. Everything else disappears. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then the, the kind of last general theme I had uh, that I want to talk about was um, how do you, in a performance, go from, and, and this might be over time experience, go from being technically perfect and sound to making it your own, adding your own feeling, adding your own aji or taste. So it's what does thing. technically perfect mean? <laughs> uh, as according no, to the I, book, I, the angles and all that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. It's, yeah, um, making it your own. This, this is a, a, a very important question, I think, because it's something that is misunderstood. Um, if you think of Western arts generally, whether it be painting or sculpture or music and so on, there are, and photography, and uh, there are styles which the artist seeks to um, impose on the, the, the creation, whatever that creation is. Um, and so, well, seeks to impose. Now, maybe that's too strong. A, too strong a phrase. I, I take that back. Um, but the the artistic style of the time will certainly determine aspects of how they express what it is they're creating. Um, so, for example, I don't know. Early Beethoven couldn't have been any different to what it was because it's very similar to late Mozart and Haydn. He just couldn't be anything different. It wouldn't have been accepted. Nobody would have listened to it. Um, you know, similarly, the artists of the time of Michelangelo and, and uh, his contemporaries, they painted in a certain style and a certain manner and, and certain subjects. They, they were expected and they couldn't deviate far from from those things and so um, their skill was f channeled into expressing certain things in certain ways um, and um, an artist a photographer ex for example might um, move more towards landscapes and certain colors and certain designs and certain shapes and so 
uh, there will be a consistency in what they produce, which you might call their style. Now, whether that is consciously applied, which is what I said at first and took back, or whether it's not, whether it's just a process of development of their creativity, um, it, it's difficult to say. But there will be a style whereby, with a sufficient body of work, you can recognise the work of, a, a, of an individual creative artist. Um, but with Budo, it's slightly different because we are we are creating a performance of something that exists, but we're not trying to create our own performance of it in, in the sense that we're not trying to create our interpretation. Um, in fact, we're trying to do exactly the opposite. We're trying to show the kata rather than me doing the kata. Um, and this is something that I say to, to students and people that I work with when they are working towards sixth dan and above. That is, you have to get to a point where rather than saying, look at me doing the kata, you're saying, this is the kata. I'm doing it, but the kata should be a pure thing which is separate from the person doing it. It will not always be the same because everybody is different, but those differences are natural aspects of their character which come through in the specific timing, the specific choice of movements, the, the, the character of the movement of the weapon and so on. And these are personal things. This is like Fukaku, personal character coming through the performance rather than personal interpretation applied to the performance. And this is something which is quite different between Eastern arts and Western arts. Western arts, you expect the creative artist to be expressing themselves through the subject, whereas with, not always, but pre predominantly, whereas with Eastern art, you're expecting the, um, the performance of the uh, kata or whatever it is, the song, the piece of music for shamisen or whatever, um, you're expecting that to be performed in a very pure, very correct, very precise way, but so precise and so correct and so well practiced that the natural character of the player comes through the performance rather than being applied to the performance. Wow, that, that's such a deep insight. Like when, I'm, when I think about it and you're talking about how in art it's like you're looking at uh, the different evolutions of a, you know, I don't really know painting, but Van Gogh paintings where he started out being very like too by the book and it gradually yeah. changed over time. And as it changes, you're getting a glimpse into how he was changing. So you're not, mm. you're using the painting to see into his mind. Whereas yeah. in, in this kata, you're just like, it doesn't really matter who this person is. Yes, maybe in, I don't know, in a grading situation or whatever you want to, but, but in, in essence, you just want to be, make sure that you're, you're seeing the scenario that the kata is defined under. Mm -hmm. and, yes, sure. And, and it could exist in multiple ways, um, mm -hmm. but it won't feel... So it's like, a, well, it's, it's like a paradox in some ways. Like it's, if, it's, if it's truly your own, then it will show up as a pure kata because it's naturally coming from you. But if you yeah. try to make it your own, then you're not actually paying respects to you're, what it is. You're just, yeah, you're distorting it. Yeah. You're distorting it. Yeah, it is, it is a paradox. It's an interesting paradox. You know, the, the term hanshi is generally translated loosely as meaning a person who can't be criticized or a person who, whose performance is, is beyond judgment. Um, and what that really means is that this person has so much knowledge and so much experience that the choices that they decide to make are not um, uh, are, are not to be judged. They they are sufficiently knowledgeable and experienced to be able to make a decision about how something is done, and that's it. You can't criticize it, but everyone does it differently. So if you put, you take five hanshi at random, 
and you, you get them all to do an embu of the same kata. All those kata will be different, but you can't say any one of them is wrong. So what does that actually mean? Well, it means that the, um, the, the substance of the kata is correctly performed and any places where they've had to make a decision about something has come from a level of experience that is beyond criticism. And so that one is correct, that one is correct, that one is correct, but they're all different. And so when you're studying these performances and you're trying to learn from them, the details that you're looking for are not the differences, but they're the similarities. Those are the points where you learn how the kata works. Everything else is their, I say their interpretation, and that's almost like I'm contradicting what I said previously. I'm not contradicting what I said previously, but there are certain things that are not specified and you have to make a decision about how you're going to do it. But that decision doesn't come from uh, uh, an ego-based desire to apply a personal style to the kata. It comes from a depth of understanding and knowledge that says, this is how I want to do it. This is how, this is how I will do it in order to express the kata in the way that I believe is the pure form of the kata. You'll have a different opinion to another handshi, but th that's fine. That's, that's absolutely fine. It's, it's where they're similar that, that is important. In the, in the same way, if I, if I bring it back to Seitei, probably it's easier to understand. Um, there is the saying that there is only one Seitei, and the Seitei is when you do all of the things in the book as described in the book. But there are a lot of grey areas where they could be done slightly differently. And so if those things are done differently, how can you say that there is only one Seite? Well, there's only one Seite because the things that are described in the book must be done the way they're described in the book. Um, so for example, you make Nukitsuke and you're going to lift the sword into Kaburi to make Kiriroshi. Now we know because the book says that the Kasaki must thrust back past your left ear, the sword mustn't drop below horizontal, and it mustn't stop overhead. But what is the exact path of the sword? From, from Nukitsuke, uh, you can see here uh, with my pen, from Nukitsuke, does my hand and the sword rise at the same time as it goes past my ear, ear and come up overhead, or does my hand stay low and the kasaki push up past my ear, and then this angle become the angle of the kaburi ready to cut. These are two different ways of doing the same thing. Um, and choosing which one to do is not imposing a style, it's making the technique as described practical in a way that you can reproduce and, and always do with consistency. And that consistency is important. That consistency becomes your personal character coming through. All those choices become your personal character coming through in the performance. Mm -hmm. Well, as usual, you always give us so much to noodle on in our heads. <laughs> so this would take yeah. quite a while for me to even, I think, grasp some of that. But um, thank you so much for sharing this this time. And I hope that, yeah, let's book another session for the how you practice after six ten, how you practice after seven ten. But yeah, let's do that at your earliest convenience. You could just go to the same link. Uh, okay, yeah, you, you but can yeah. do something fast. No, yeah, but I certainly hope... we'll come back together and talk again. Well, yeah, so this one I want to bring out before 100. Uh, and then we also <laughs> have this follow-up conversation. Yeah. So thank you so yeah, much. Sure. Um, yeah, okay, we'll talk nice to, again to speak soon. to you again. Yeah, you too. Yeah. I'll talk Take to you again soon. Nice to... Bye now. Bye. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode because we have a lot more exciting conversations to share as we explore the world of the traditional Japanese martial arts. The Inside Look podcast is available on most common podcasting platforms and on YouTube. Remember to subscribe to not miss out on new interviews as they are posted. We're always looking for feedback to improve, so please write us a review or drop us a line at podcast at or on Facebook and Instagram at tokushikai.canada. 
Until next time, thanks for listening.